This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Claire Gauget. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two The Education of a Personage. Chapter Five. Part One The Egotist Becomes a Personage. A fathom deep in sleep I lie, with old desires restrained before, to clamour lifeward with a cry, as dark flies out the graying door. And so in quest of creeds to share, I seek assertive day again, but old monotony is there, endless avenues of rain. Oh, might I rise again, might I throw off the heat of that old wine, see the new morning mass the sky, with fairy towers line on line, find each mirage in the high air, a symbol not a dream again, but old monotony is there, endless avenues of rain. Under the glass portcullis of a theatre, Amory stood, watching the first great drops of rain splatter down and flatten to dark stains on the sidewalk. The air became grey and opalescent, a solitary light suddenly outlined a window over the way, then another light, then a hundred more danced and glimmered into vision. Under his feet a thick iron-studded skylight turned yellow. In the street the lamps of the taxicab sent out glistening sheens along the already black pavement. The unwelcome November rain had perversely stolen the day's last hour, and pawned it with that ancient fence, the night. The silence of the theatre behind him ended with a curious snapping sound, followed by the heavy roaring of a rising crowd, and the interlaced clatter of many voices. The matinee was over. He stood aside, edged a little into the rain to let the throng pass. A small boy rushed out, sniffed in the damp, fresh air, and turned up the collar of his coat. Came three or four couples in a great hurry. Came a further scattering of people whose eyes as they emerged glance invariably, first at the wet street, then at the rain-filled air, finally at the dismal sky. Last, a dense, strolling mass that depressed him with its heavy odor, compounded of the tobacco smell of the men, and the fetid sensuousness of stale powder on women. After the thick crowd came another scattering, a stray half-dozen, a man on crutches. Finally the rattling bang of folding seats inside announced that the ushers were at work. New York seemed not so much awakening as turning over in its bed. Pallid men rushed by, pinching together their coat collars, a great swarm of tired magpie girls from a department store crowded along with shrieks of strident laughter, three to an umbrella. A squad of marching policemen passed, already miraculously protected by oilskin capes. The rain gave Amory a feeling of detachment, and the numerous unpleasant aspects of city life without money occurred to him in threatening procession. There was the ghastly, stinking crush of the subway, the car cards thrusting themselves at one, leering out like dull boars who grab your arm with another story, the querulous worry as to whether some one isn't leaning on you, a man deciding not to give his seat to a woman, hating her for it, the woman hating him for not doing it, at worst a squalid phantasmagoria of breath, and old cloth on human bodies, and the smell of the food men ate, at best just people, too hot or too cold, tired, worried. He pictured the rooms where these people lived, where the patterns of the blistered wallpapers were heavy reiterated sunflowers on green and yellow backgrounds, where there were tin bathtubs in gloomy hallways, and verdureless, unmamable spaces in back of the buildings, where even love dressed as seduction, a sordid murder around the corner, illicit motherhood in the flat above. And always there was the economical stuffiness of indoor winter, and the long summers nightmares of perspiration between sticky, enveloping walls, dirty restaurants where careless, tired people helped themselves to sugar with their own used coffee spoons, leaving hard brown deposits in the bowl. It was not so bad where there were only men or else only women. It was when they were vilely herded that it all seemed so rotten. It was some shame that women gave off at having men see them tired and poor. It was some disgust that men had for women who were tired and poor. It was dirtier than any battlefield he had seen, harder to contemplate than any actual hardship moulded of mere and sweat and danger. It was an atmosphere wherein birth and marriage and death were loathsome, secret things. 
He remembered one day in the subway when a delivery boy had brought in a great funeral wreath of fresh flowers, how the smell of it had suddenly cleared the air and given every one in the car a momentary glow. "'I detest poor people,' thought Amory suddenly. "'I hate them for being poor. Poverty may have been beautiful once, but it's rotten now. It's the ugliest thing in the world. It's essentially cleaner to be corrupt and rich than it is to be innocent and poor.' He seemed to see again a figure whose significance had once impressed him, a well-dressed young man gazing from a club window on Fifth Avenue, and saying something to his companion with a look of utter disgust. Probably, thought Amory, what he said was, "'My God, aren't people horrible!' Never before in his life had Amory considered poor people. He thought cynically how completely he was lacking in all human sympathy— O. Henry had found in these people romance, pathos, love, hate. Amory saw only coarseness, physical filth, and stupidity. He made no self-accusations. Never any more did he reproach himself for feelings that were natural and sincere. He accepted all his reactions as a part of him, unchangeable, unmoral. This problem of poverty transformed, magnified, attached to some grander, more dignified attitude, might some day even be his problem. At present it roused only his profound distaste. He walked over to Fifth Avenue, dodging the blind black menace of umbrellas, and standing in front of Delmonico's hailed an autobus. Buttoning his coat closely around him, he climbed to the roof, where he rode in solitary state through the thin, persistent rain, stung into alertness by the cool moisture perpetually reborn on his cheek. Somewhere in his mind a conversation began, rather resumed its place in his attention. It was composed not of two voices, but of one, which acted alike as questioner and answerer. Question. Well, what's the situation? Answer. That I have about twenty-four dollars to my name. Question. You have the Lake Geneva estate. Answer. But I intend to keep it. Question. Can you live? Answer. I can't imagine not being able to. People make money in books, and I've found that I can always do things that people do in books. Really, they are the only things I can do. Question. Be definite. Answer. I don't know what I'll do, nor have I much curiosity. Tomorrow I'm going to leave New York for good. It's a bad town unless you're on top of it. Question. Do you want a lot of money? Answer. No. I am merely afraid of being poor. Question. Very afraid? Answer. Just passively afraid. Question. Where are you drifting? Answer. Don't ask me. Question. Don't you care? Answer. Rather, I don't want to commit moral suicide. Question. Have you no interests left? Answer. None. I've no more virtue to lose. Just as a cooling pot gives off heat, so all through youth and adolescence we give off calories of virtue. That's what's called ingeniousness. Question. An interesting idea. Answer. That's why a good man going wrong attracts people. They stand around and literally warm themselves at the calories of virtue he gives off. Sarah makes an unsophisticated remark, and the face simper in delight. How innocent the poor child is! They're warming themselves at her virtue. But Sarah sees the simper and never makes that remark again, only she feels a little colder after that. Question. All your calories gone? Answer. All of them. I'm beginning to warm myself at other people's virtue. Question. Are you corrupt? Answer. I think so. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about good and evil at all any more. Question. Is that a bad sign in itself? Answer. Not necessarily. Question. What would be the test of corruption? Answer. Becoming really insincere, calling myself not such a bad fellow, thinking I regretted my lost youth when I only envy the delights of losing it. Youth is like having a big plate of candy. Sentimentalists think they want to be in the pure, simple state they were in before they ate the candy. They don't. They just want the fun of eating it all over again. The matron doesn't want to repeat her girlhood. She wants to repeat her honeymoon. I don't want to repeat my innocence. I want the pleasure of losing it again question. Where are you drifting? This dialogue merged grotesquely into his mind's most familiar state, a grotesque blending of desires, worries, exterior impressions, and physical reactions. 127th Street, or 137th Street. Two and three look alike. 
No, not much. Seat damp. Are clothes absorbing wetness from seat, or seat absorbing dryness from clothes? Sitting on wet substance gave appendicitis, so Froggy Parker's mother said. Well, he'd had it. I'll sue the steamboat company, Beatrice said, and my uncle has a quarter interest. Did Beatrice go to heaven? Probably not. He represented Beatrice's immortality, also love affairs of numerous dead men who surely had never thought of him. If it wasn't appendicitis, influenza maybe. What? 120th Street? That must have been 112th back there. 102 instead of 127. Rosalind not like Beatrice. Eleanor like Beatrice, only wilder and brainier. Apartments along here expensive. Probably hundred and fifty a month. Maybe two hundred. Uncle had only paid hundred a month for a whole great big house in Minneapolis. Question. Were the stairs on the left or right as you came in? Anyway, in twelve Univee they were straight back into the left. What a dirty river! Want to go down there and see if it's dirty? French rivers all brown or black. So were southern rivers. Twenty-four dollars meant four hundred and eighty doughnuts. He could live on it three months and sleep in the park. Wonder where Jill was. Jill Bain. Fane. Sane. What the devil? Neck hurts. Darned uncomfortable seat. No desire to sleep with Jill. What could Alec see in her? Alec had a coarse taste in women. Own taste the best. Isabel, Clara, Rosalind, Eleanor were all American. Eleanor would pitch probably southpaw. Rosalind was outfield, wonderful hitter. Clara first base, maybe. Wonder what Humbird's body looked like now. If he himself hadn't been bayonet instructor, he'd have gone up to line three months sooner, probably been killed. Where's the darned bell? The street numbers of Riverside Drive were obscured by the mist and dripping trees from anything but the swiftest scrutiny, but Amory had finally caught sight of one, 127th Street. He got off and with no distinct destination followed a winding, descending sidewalk and came out facing the river, in particular a long pier and a partitioned litter of shipyards for miniature craft, small launches, canoes, rowboats, and catboats. He turned northward and followed the shore jumped a small wire fence, and found himself in a great disorderly yard adjoining a dock. The hulls of many boats in various stages of repair were around him. He smelled of the sawdust and paint, and the scarcely distinguishable fiat odor of the Hudson. A man approached through the heavy gloom. "'Hello,' said Amory. "'Got a pass?' "'No. Is this private?' "'This is the Hudson River Sporting and Yacht Club.' "'Oh, I didn't know. I'm just resting.' "'Well?' began the man dubiously. "'I'll go if you want me to.' The man made noncommittal noises in his throat and passed on. Amory sedated himself on an overturned boat, and leaned forward thoughtfully until his chin rested in his hand. "'Misfortune is liable to make me a damn bad man,' he said slowly. IN THE DROOPING HOURS While the rain drizzled on, Amory looked futilely back at the stream of his life, all its glittering and dirty shallows. To begin with, he was still afraid, not physically afraid any more, but afraid of people and prejudice and misery and monotony. Yet deep in his bitter heart he wondered if he was, after all, worse than this man or the next. He knew that he could sophisticate himself finally into saying that his own weakness was just the result of circumstances and environment, that often when he raged at himself, as an egotist, something would whisper ingratiatingly, no, genius! That was one manifestation of fear, that voice which whispered that he could not be both great and good, that genius was the exact combination of those inexplicable grooves and twists in his mind, that any discipline would curb it to mediocrity. Probably more than any concrete vice or failing, Amory despised his own personality. He loathed, knowing that to-morrow and the thousand days after he would swell pompously at a compliment, and sulk at an ill word like a third-rate musician or a first-class actor. He was ashamed of the fact that very simple and honest people usually distrusted him, that he had been cruel often to those who had sunk their personalities in him. Several girls, and a man here and there through college that he had been an evil influence on, people who had followed him here and there into mental adventures from which he alone rebounded unscathed. Usually on nights like this, for there had been many lately, he could escape from this consuming introspection 
by thinking of children and the infinite possibilities of children. He leaned and listened, and he heard a startled baby awake in a house across the street, and lend a tiny whimper to the still night. Quick as a flash he turned away, wondering with a touch of panic whether something in his brooding despair of his mood had made a darkness in its tiny soul. He shivered. What if some day the balance was overturned, and he became a thing that frightened children and crept into rooms in the dark, approached dim communion with those phantoms who whispered shadowy secrets to the mad of the dark continent upon the moon? Amory smiled a bit. "'You're too much wrapped up in yourself,' he heard someone say, and again. "'Get out and do some real work. Stop worrying.' He fancied a possible future comment of his own. "'Yes, I was perhaps an egotist in youth, but I soon found it made me morbid to think too much about myself.' Suddenly he felt an overwhelming desire to let himself go to the devil. Not to go violently as a gentleman should, but to sink safely and sensuously out of sight— he pictured himself in an adobe house in Mexico, half reclining on a rug-covered couch, his slender, artistic fingers closed on a cigarette, while he listened to guitars strumming melancholy undertones to an age-old dirge of Castile and an olive-skinned, carmine-lipped girl caressed his hair. Here he might live a strange litany, delivered from right and wrong, and from the hound of heaven and from every god except the exotic Mexican, who was pretty slack himself and rather addicted to oriental sense, delivered from success and hope and poverty into that long shoot of indulgence, which led, after all, only to the artificial lake of death. There were so many places where one might deteriorate pleasantly. Port Said, Shanghai, parts of Turkestan, Constantinople, the South Seas, all lands of sad, haunting music and many odors, where lust could be a mode and expression of life, where the shades of night skies and sunset would seem to reflect only moods of passion, the colors of lips and poppies. Once he had been miraculously able to scent evil as a horse detects a broken bridge at night, but the man with the queer feet in Phoebe's room had diminished to the aura over Jill. His instinct perceived the fetidness of poverty, but no longer fretted out the deeper evils in pride and sensuality. There were no more wise men, there were no more heroes. Burn Holiday was sunk from sight as though he had never lived. Monseigneur was dead. Amory had grown up to a thousand books, a thousand lies. He had listened eagerly to people who pretended to know, who knew nothing. The mystical reveries of saints that had once filled him with awe in the still hours of night now vaguely repelled him. The Byrons and Brooks, who had defied life from mountain-tops, were in the end but flanners and posers, at best mistaking the shadows of courage for the substance of wisdom. The pageantry of his delusion took shape in a world-old procession of prophets, Athenians, martyrs, saints, scientists, Don Juans, Jesuits, Puritans, Fausts, poets, pacifists. Like costumed alumni at a college reunion, they streamed before him as their dreams, personalities, and creeds had in turn thrown colored lights on his soul. Each had tried to express the glory of life and the tremendous significance of man. Each had boasted of synchronizing what had gone before into his own rickety generalities. Each had depended, after all, on the set stage and the convention of the theatre, which is that man, in his hunger for faith, will feed his mind with the nearest and most convenient food. Women, of whom he had expected so much, whose beauty he had hoped to transmute into modes of art, whose unfathomable instincts, marvellously incoherent and inaccurate, he had thought to perpetuate in terms of experience, had become merely consecrations to their own posterity. Isabel, Clara, Rosalind, Eleanor were all removed by their very beauty, around which men had swarmed, from the possibility of contributing anything but a sick heart and a page of puzzled words to write. Amory based his loss of faith and help from others on several sweeping syllogisms. Granted that his generation, however bruised and decimated from this Victorian war, were the heirs of progress. Waving aside petty differences of conclusions which, although they might occasionally cause the deaths of several millions of young men, might be explained away, supposing that after all Bernard Shaw and Bernardi 
Bonner Law and Bethim and Holweg were mutual heirs of progress, if only in agreeing against the ducking of witches, waving the antitheses and approaching individually these men who seemed to be the leaders. He was repelled by the discrepancies and contradictions in the men themselves. There was, for example, Thornton Hancock, respected by half the intellectual world as an authority on life, a man who had verified and believed the code he lived by, an educator of educators, an adviser to presidents. Yet Amory knew that this man had in his heart leaned on the priest of another religion. And Monseigneur, upon whom a cardinal rested, had moments of strange and horrible insecurity, inexplicable in a religion that explained even disbelief in terms of its own faith. If you doubted the devil, it was the devil that made you doubt him. Amory had seen Monseigneur go to the houses of stolid Philistines, read popular novels furiously, saturate himself in routine to escape from that horror and this priest, a little wiser, somewhat purer, had been, Amory knew, not essentially older than he. Amory was alone. He had escaped from a small enclosure into a great labyrinth. He was where Goeth was when he began Faust. He was where Conrad was when he wrote Almayer's Folly. Amory said to himself that there were essentially two sorts of people who through natural clarity of disillusion left the enclosure and sought the labyrinth. There were men like Wells and Plato, who had, half unconsciously, a strange hidden orthodoxy, who would accept for themselves only what could be accepted for all men, incurable romanticists who never, for all their efforts, could enter the labyrinth of stark souls. There were, on the other hand, sword-like pioneering personalities, Samuel Butler, Renan, Voltaire, who progressed much slower, yet eventually much further, not in the direct pessimistic line of speculative philosophy, but concerned in the eternal attempt to attach a positive value to life. Amory stopped. He began, for the first time in his life, to have a strong distrust of all generalities and epigrams. They were too easy, too dangerous to the public mind, yet all thought usually reached the public after thirty years in some such form. Benson and Chesterton had popularized Huisman and Newman, Shaw had sugar-coated Nietzsche, and Ibsen and Schopenhauer. The man in the street heard the conclusions of dead genius through someone else's clever paradoxes and didactic epigrams. Life was a damned muddle. A football game with everyone offside, and the referee gotten rid of, everyone claiming the referee would have been on his side. Progress was a labyrinth. People plunging blindly in and then rushing wildly back, shouting that they had found it, the invisible king, the élan vital, the principle of evolution, writing a book, starting a war, founding a school. Amory, even had he not been a selfish man, would have started all inquiries with himself. He was his own best example, sitting in the rain, a human creature of sex and pride, foiled by chance in his own temperament, of the balm of love and children, preserved to help in building up the living consciousness of the race. In self-reproach and loneliness and disillusion he came to the entrance of the labyrinth. A belated taxi hurried along the street, its lamp still shining like burning eyes in a face white from a night's carouse. A melancholy siren sounded far down the river. Monseigneur Amory kept thinking how Monseigneur would have enjoyed his own funeral. It was magnificently Catholic and liturgical. Bishop O'Neill sang solemn high mass, and the cardinal gave the final absolutions. Thornton Hancock, Mrs. Lawrence, the British and Italian ambassadors, the papal delegate, and a host of friends and priests were there. Yet the inexorable shears had cut through all these threads that Monseigneur had gathered into his hands. To Amory it was a haunting grief to see him lying in his coffin, with closed hands upon his purple vestments. His face had not changed, and as he never knew he was dying it showed no pain or fear. It was Amory's dear old friend, his and the others, for the church was full of people with daft, staring faces, the most exalted seeming the most stricken. The cardinal, like an archangel in cope and murder, sprinkled the holy water, the organ broke into sound, the choir began to sing the Requiem Eternam. All these people grieved because they had to some extent depended upon Monseigneur. 
Their grief was more than sentiment for the crack in his voice, or a certain break in his walk, as Wells put it. These people had leaned on Monseigneur's faith, his way of finding cheer or making religion a thing of lights and shadows, making all light and shadow merely aspects of God. People felt safe when he was near. Of Amory's attempted sacrifice had been born merely the full realization of his disillusion, but of Monseigneur's funeral was born the romantic elf who was to enter the labyrinth with him. He found something that he wanted, had always wanted, and always would want, not to be admired, as he had feared, not to be loved, as he had made himself believe, but to be necessary to people, to be indispensable. He remembered the sense of security he had found in Burn. Life opened up in one of its amazing bursts of radiance, and Amory suddenly and permanently rejected an old epigram that had been playing listlessly in his mind. Very few things matter, and nothing matters very much. On the contrary, Amory felt an immense desire to give people a sense of security. End of Book 2, Chapter 5, Part 1